London. And I always say that there's a lot of talent that comes out of North West London and it has been coming out of North West London. And today I'm sitting next to an actor who is from North West London. From afar I've been watching and being super proud of because he's doing excellent things in Hollywood films, global TV series that are hits everywhere. Um, it's an amazing journey that he's had and he's still so humble with it. It's a true honour to introduce Monso and Monso. Thank you for being here, thank sir. You, thank, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. So, let's get into your journey. I know you're from North West London, but you have Ibo Nigerian roots. Yes. How have your roots shaped who you are, and I guess even added to who you are as a person? How has my roots shaped who I am? Well, I, you know, as much as I grew up in, I've always been in North West somehow. I've always been in Camden, and then moved to Leesden, and then Wembley, and eventually I've moved slightly out and further out of London, but North West is the core. Yes! So there's, <laughs> definitely, there's definitely that, <laughs> there's definitely that influence, but I would say the Nigerian culture that my parents brought over when they came over in the 70s, um, I, I stayed with them, and, and it's kind of in me as well, when it comes in the food, it comes in the music, in the culture, in many facets, and the discipline, I would say, more than anything, that um, I could notice the difference between me and some of my friends growing up, was that harsh discipline that they broke from Nigeria, I really felt like, you know, just doing okay isn't good enough, <laughs> just doing, you know, if you've got a beat, and that was your first B you got, you must get A. <laughs> if you get A, it has to be A plus yeah. or A star. And now it's even numbers, so it'll be like you have to get yeah. 10. <laughs> you know what I mean? So back in the day it was it was you know, it was very it's a very hard to please mum. Because I grew up in a in a single parent home. Um, although, you know, my dad was around till I was like eight and then um, but my mum was a very, you know, very strong matriarchal character and sometimes a matriarchal character both the both the man and the woman. You know, and I, you know, I thank God for her life and what she instilled in me. And um, it's quite unusual actually for um, for most Nigerians to become actors and actors, you know, actresses. I think um, the standard thing is to go into medicine or engineering or, or law. That was the stand that was what you did and that's what your parents wanted to be able to find out on my my son is a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not so at the end of the day, you kind of just the fact that I wanted to act was totally un-Nigerian. Do you know what I mean? So, but my mother wanted to act when she was younger. Oh wow! Um, she wanted to perform in general. She had a, she has a you know, good singing voice, and she um, actually wanted to, they wanted to take her on a, a, a nationwide tour where she would sing wow. with this choir in Nigeria. But my grandma kind of just said no. She kind of, she was hard-nosed about it. She kind of beat it out of her. She was like, nope, you ain't going to do that. So when I showed interest, she said, well, if you're serious about it and you really want to do it, then I back you on that, you know. So I'm, I went into it 100%. And I've got her to thank for it. She said, well, as long as you make money out of it and you could support yourself, you know, then I'm happy to support you. And she did. And I never looked back. That's like, I think that's kind of part of maybe the cultural shift that a lot of us who come from migrant parents um, experience. Because even me, I'm from the Caribbean, I'm from Barbados and Dominica. Mm -hmm. um, both my parents are Barbadian, my mum's half Dominican. And um, uh, trying to explain to them that I wanted to pursue a career in the entertainment industry, are you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> like, they just did, yeah. not, did not understand it. And um, I think show and tell with my um, parents, I think they have to kind of see the uh, the seriousness, see and see that it can actually lead to something. I think the first time my mum actually saw that I was on TV, I think she was like, oh, okay, so he's not just trying to mess about. There's actually maybe um, something that he's trying to do. And I think that's a, a shift that a lot of us, maybe of our generation, a generation after have gone through, especially being parents of migrants. Like my, uh, my dad was born in Barbados. My mum was born here, but was raised in Barbados at Dominica. Right. So a lot of her thinking reflected that of the Caribbean as well. And it is that. Yeah. It's like, look, we've come over here to give you an opportunity. Go and study. Like, yeah. I, I, exactly. I basically went to boy, university for them. Boy, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mom, yeah boy, exactly. Mom. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Oh, you want to be a what? Yeah, <laughs> and I wanted to be an actor. They were like, you want to be an actor? <laughs> 
he was like, look, look, he, he, he said to me, you can be an actor without training in it, so go and do a degree, and if you want to still do acting, go and do it. But he was trying to just kind of push me off the path, but he didn't realise I was going to go and still find my way back in. But actually yeah. speaking about that, yeah. um, my journey into all of this um, has been through acting. Mm -hmm. um, I trained, and with that, I know that the school, uh, the Central School of Speech and, and Drama, um, where you attended mm -hmm. is one of the biggest establishments in the country yeah. for actors mm -hmm. um amazing achievement that you went there and trained Thank but you. i'm very interested though in the journey to get in there yeah. um how like what was it like what kind of framed your mind to understand that yes i want to train as an actor well the training part didn't come for a long time for a long time actually when i was around the same time my dad kind of left the scene i started really I think now when I look back I was probably looking for some kind of male role model mm. and there was a man called Lord Eric Sugamuku who was this um, Ghanaian man he was a man of many talents he, was, he would DJ at people's weddings he would he would um, be you know, an MC and he was a storyteller and every week they would take us to Queen's Crescent Library in Camden and he would read us these African stories and it, it was only for like one term but I remember how explosive he was and how animated he was with everything and how he would he would capture the whole room and that was white people black people everyone was was captivated by this black man and this to me he was this huge black man yeah, yeah. um and i was just inspired by that yeah. and i said i want to do that <laughs> i want to be that yeah and eventually this storytelling turned into acting okay. turned into and my love of films I think very early on in life, I used to sit up and watch Movie Drome, and that's yeah. for people who are my age that will remember that on BBC <laughs> Two. Um, so they would pick a film, review yeah. it, and then play the film, okay. and then talk about it afterwards on BBC Two. They should bring and that they, back. They, yeah, they, yeah they, they was a brilliant, it was a brilliant um, thing that they did. I'd watch movies on that, and then they did this black film season on Channel 4. I must have been about 10 at that time, 10 or 11. It was, yeah, about 10 or 11, it was around 1990. And I remember um, watching Cry Freedom, um, The Color Purple, a film called The Kitchen Toto, um, Cry the Beloved Country. These were black films that I had never seen. I was probably too young to watch these, a lot of these yeah, films. Yeah. They were very strong, yeah. powerful films. But I was inspired in such a way that I wanted to do that. But it was also around the time that I started to become aware of myself, of my blackness and having been called the n-word a few times at school and having understanding my difference especially in an area where there wasn't so many black people there were black people about but there wasn't so many and you could feel it and i could feel and i'd be like i remember being a kid and being, why is it always us and yeah. wanting to do something about it to change it mm -hmm. and that kind of said i said that if i can be an actor and i can inspire one person to make me feel make them feel how I feel right now watching these movies and the sense that I can do something and change something, then I've done my job. And I think that is where it started from. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was into comics as well and, and Superman and Batman and all those kind of things. And something about being a superhero or just wanting to play those roles yeah. or wanting to tell that story. I, got, I get so much and still do from great storytelling, great, watching great films that make you hold your breath, that yeah. make you, you know, sit on the edge of your seat. And that, for me, is what I want to do. I want to give, I almost give back what I've always received from these movies, you know. I'm, one of my pet hates is when people go and watch a film or go and watch a play and they're just like, yeah, it's just part of their evening, oh, it was all right, and, you know, or, <laughs> or, or, or if it's emotional, if it's something that makes them have a reaction, and then they say, oh, well, you know, it was too much. I just, I didn't want to be moved by that. I, I think I just, I stepped out. I didn't want to watch the rest of it. That's the whole point of it for me. True. The whole point is that you hit the audience True. with something they can take home and think about and they feel in their heart. True. And for me, that's, hopefully when you watch me perform, um, that's what you get from it. Yeah. And, it, you know, it started from there. And the journey was not easy. I think all the way through school, I was quite a loner. I was quite um, shy. A lot of people, some people who really know me will remember that time when I didn't really, I kind of, 
because again with my mum being such a you know harsh disciplinarian I used to want to hang out with the bad boys yes. who wanted to wear the same things and they rock the same gear yeah, yeah. and I remember trying to say to my mum one day <laughs> you know I wanted these and that, in those days New Balance was the, was the thing yeah it's crazy they've come back New Balance yeah. was the, was, were back. the trainers yeah. it wasn't Nikes or, mm-hmm. or like you know so I remember saying, Mom, I want those trainers. And my mom was just like, and I tried to talk to her like, I've heard one of my friends talk to their mom. Yeah. <laughs> and I said to my mom, listen, listen. I said, shut up, mom. Oh, my days. I said, shut up to a Nigerian woman. You're crazy. Listen, <laughs> when I tell you I got the beating <laughs> of my life, from that day, I actually realized if I don't fix up, my mom, she wouldn't mean to, but she could kill me. <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I actually said that to myself. Yeah. And, I actually, I, and I think I was going into the early years of secondary school at that point. And I, I was just like, and because I was always one of the tallest kids, I'm yeah. six foot six now, so yeah. I was always very tall and yeah. big. And I would always, people always wanted the big kids in their gang. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because if you got into a fight, you, can handle you at least look intimidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, people wanted to draw me into that. And I yeah. just always just stayed by myself. Yeah. So it was, and that led to me being kind of introverted and shy, but I would just observe people and understand. And, and I always, always had this thing in the back of my head that I'm going to be an actor, I'm going to be on a stage, I'm going to be in front of cameras. And it, what I didn't realise I was doing back then was visualising w- where I was going to be and creating a reality before it was there for everybody else to see. I could see it in my own mind. I'm a big believer in that, and I didn't even realise I was doing it so early. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of the stage that you speak about, um, the training that you went kind of created a, a thespian. You know, for people that don't know what a thespian is, it's a cultured stage actor. Mm-hmm. And um, you were actually the first, uh, sorry, the youngest person to play, to play King Lear. And you also did an award winning performance as Othello as well. Yeah. Shakespeare isn't easy. It isn't easy. It's so not. take me to that, how, how that was. You know what? I think my love for Shakespeare probably started in secondary school and I did my A-levels in English and drama and my English teacher asked me to read out a speech from King Lear, strangely enough I think it was a speech that Cordelia um, the first speech that Cordelia makes to King Lear when he's, she says, I love you um, I love you no more no less, but how a daughter should love her father, words to that effect and I remember um she, I read the speech and the teacher said to me, Nonto, that was wonderful. How did you, have you done this before? And I said, I've never read Shakespeare in my life. And then she was like, you have a natural kind of understanding of the Iambic pentameter yes. and the flow of how it should sound. And I didn't know what she was talking about at that time, yeah, yeah. but I started to try and read more. And then I would get the versions that you could get. You've got the old folio, the original folio, and then you've got the modern day English on one side. So you could really understand. So I did that as you're supposed to do in school, but I started to really like it and love it, and I started to go and see plays. Um, and when you start drama school, they take you through the intricate knowledge of, of um, segmenting or uniting your play, understanding the actions on every line, every word, what you're trying to do to the other person you're speaking to or what you're trying to do to the audience to understand your motivation in everything you do and and to to fully get underneath the text of what's being said, the subtext and and the the words that are being spoken. So for me I really feel like um, that understanding of it came and meshed with my love of the language and the initial passion for acting and Shakespeare I've, I've, I, it's a love affair that I have with yeah. him and I, I've, I kind of feel like I'm going to do another play pretty soon Good. I haven't done a play for a long time yeah. but, um, but doing, um, playing King Lear was an amazing thing to play at 23 Crazy. I only recently realised it was in the Guinness Book of Records Crazy. I had no idea well done mate um, thank you man and it was, it was a, a, I was nervous I was nervous. I said to the director, Declan Donnellan, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said to me, that's okay, because I don't know what I'm going to do either. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm, I'm just as afraid as you, but we're going to step into this together. And that's the, and I'm gr- so glad he said those words to me, because that's exactly how I approach everything. Yeah. 
if if something is frightening to me, I kind of want to do it more. Good. I kind of want to jump in because of that experience. Mm. I don't want to do something that's safe. Oh, I can do that. Oh, I can do that. Mm. That doesn't really excite me. But the the fact that I feel like there's a possibility I could fail or I'm going to need to leap into this to make it work, that excites me a hell of a lot more. 100%. You know, because it actually stretches you and you grow and you learn something from it. I agree. And you spoke earlier a little bit about your height. You know, mm-hmm. at six foot six, you stand at height. Some of us will never know. Yeah? <laughs> and, um, you know, I understand it because I know what it's like to tower over people as well. Um, <laughs> but what I wanted to ask, tall in person. I am, very it, tall in person. you have to see me. Yeah? Um, I've got a bad back at the moment because I'm, I'm crouching. Um, <laughs> but, you know, with being, I guess, such a tall figure, when it comes to auditions and, I guess, characters where you have to, I guess, be a vulnerable character yeah. or show vulnerability, do you find that there is an obstacle there or do you have your methods of, of getting around it? You know what, I, I really find, I really think it's quite interesting. I was talking to my friend about this the other day and he said to me, not so, do you realise, like, you starting out, in the, I think it's changed a lot now because of so many people who have come before me have changed things. And, and he said, you don't, like, you're six foot six, you're a big <laughs> black guy and you've been cast to play doctors, you've been cast to play kings you've been cast to play samson all these characters yeah. and it's it's really got to anything to do with your size it's kind of just about you know what you bring in terms of your vulnerability in yeah. terms of your intelligence and i think i think it's partly because you know i read a script and if the character speaks to me as something that is going to challenge me like i said it's going to do something different i want to do you know but when I met my agent, uh, Megan Willis, I really, I, I had met with, because at the time I had done King Lear and uh, so many people wanted to me to sign. Um, when you're hot, that's yeah. what you find, that goes, everybody yeah. wants to <laughs> yeah. know. So she was, a, she was a, a small independent agent and she listened to me. She said, okay. And the first thing she put me up for was a TV series called Martin Chuzzlewit, which was one of these drama series which is a totally white cast and she put me up for a white character Crazy. and I was like this is who I want this yeah, is who I need on my side and I've got a, I mean I have got a lot of faith in, in God I have a relationship, personal relationship with God I'm a you know I'm a Christian and I really feel like although sometimes I don't act like a Christian <laughs> I've got to say we, but none of us you know are none of us are perfect we're all walking that, that road to find our way but I've got to say I've just act I don't know of any other reason, apart from those decisions that I make with scripts and my agent being such a great asset, um, I really feel like it's just a blessing, like God has blessed me with being seen, because there's certain things that have happened at the right place, at the right time, when you, you know, it couldn't have happened any other way. And I think it's that and also being ready. You know, Denzel Washington Washington said, um, success is where opportunity meets readiness. And if you're ready for the opportunity, then you have success. I agree. And that's why so many people say, you know, I never got those opportunities. I never. And if you look back in your life, you probably had one or two. And that's all you're going to get is one or two opportunities. But maybe you weren't ready for that opportunity. 100%. It's if you're ready for that opportunity when it comes. So you've got, it's a process of staying ready. It's a process of being ready for whatever is thrown at you. And in this industry, you never know what's coming around the corner. And you, you, know, you spoke about, um, I guess, casting, being mm-hmm. casted. Um, last minute changes, cuts um, yeah. to casting is something that actors are used to. They know it. And it happened to you quite early in your career where yeah. you had a role in Northern Lights. Yes. And um, you were uh, uh, recasted as Sir Ian. Well, Sir Ian McKellen was recasted as your character. Yeah. And to me personally, I feel like that's quite a massive um, compliment it's to you. It's kind because of a compliment, yeah. It, if the person only deemed to be good enough to take your place is Sir Ian McKellen, Obviously, you're doing something right. And I know the director, Chris White, um, was very um, upset was, yeah. about it because he yeah. had so much faith in your ability. But my question more lies in, you know, how do you and have you dealt with that kind of situation? Because I think it's important for like, younger professionals who are maybe going to come into this yes. to know this happens. And how do you set your mind to deal with those types of Oh, the best thing to, to know straight away from the start as a young actor come into this, you're going to 
fail just as much as you're going to succeed. Yeah. And for every one thing I've, I get, every one job I get, there's probably about 10 I don't get. Mm. And, and that's, that's actually quite a high ratio for actors. Yeah. Like, it's going to be, on average, probably every 25 things you don't get, there's going to be one thing you get. So it's to have that, to develop that understanding, first of all, is going to be the hard thing. Mm. With that um, situation specifically, um, I remember I, the audition process alone was, Vigorous. I think, two months long. Ooh. I kept on going in for auditions. They had had a different director in at first, and then Chris Weitz came on board, and I, you know, I met up with him, went out to dinner with him, recorded the voice, because it was like a movement part where I was wearing a green suit a okay. lot, and they recorded my voice. For the, for the character and I you know and that it was about eight months we filmed and then we came back and we filmed an additional two and a half months and then right before the film came out it was coming out in December it was a Christmas movie and I think the beginning of November I'd actually started getting fan mail from people around the world about the character because the books are so well loved so I'm getting ready to go to the premiere I'm getting ready for my life to change you know because everybody hypes these things up um, and you know, it's a major motion picture that's coming out all over the world simultaneously. And I get this letter in the post, and it's quite thick, but it looks quite a kind of like a formal handwritten letter. So I open it up, and I just open it, and it says Chris White's at the top. And it said, As much as it pains me to write this letter, I was like, Oh, something's not right. And I remember the feeling of. It was like a deadness, like a weight in your belly that just goes down. And you just get this sick feeling. Because you've put so much work into something and it, it's not like you haven't done it. It's not like you didn't get the part, yeah. but you, you know, and it, it hurt. It was like, oh. And I remember, I remember, I did, I cried. I took, took a moment, cried. Um, I was at my mom's house at the time. And I remember her saying, what's the matter? And I said, it's not happening. And she was just like, ah. Oh. She said, F them. You can do better. <laughs> that sounds like my She mom. was just like, you know what? You know, she was back supporting me straight away. Yeah. And, I, you know, I needed that. And I took that day to, to mourn it. I took the day. Then I said, I can't stay in this place. Yeah. Because I, I, and that's the thing. I, people always say, why are you always so positive? And I think, I don't think you can afford to stay and dwell in that. You should always deal with your emotions properly. Yeah. I'm not saying ignore them, but you can't stay in that place for too long. Because as an actor, you need to walk into rooms and convince people to spend money on you. Yeah. To invest money in you. Yeah. How am I going to pay you this much money to do this thing if I don't, if you, when you walk in the room, I'm not convinced? True. So I, so I pretty much came out of that and I went straight into into filming something else, the cat happened straight away, which was the... This is what I was about to talk about, that. That kind of happened. Yes, oh my... Right, let's get into cast. yeah? Because yeah? that's a... I guess it's a better time as well. Yeah. And for me... Well, it came out of that moment. Okay. That moment, they had actually offered me cast, and we weren't sure whether it was going to film or not, or this and that. And part of me being involved in this big movie was part of the reason why how they were selling Cass. Okay. Like he's the voice of, of this and this movie. So it still had a follow one. So it had a kind yeah. of, that was part of the reason why I got the role. Okay. So I didn't tell them that I wasn't, <laughs> I was no longer doing that movie. I kind of just got, got myself together and started filming. Yeah. Cass was an amazing, oh. amazing opportunity. Um, it was one of those movies that it was my first lead where I'm the out and out lead. I played Cass and Cass Pennant. I got yeah. to meet him, meet his family. Um, it's basically the story of a young uh, black man who was adopted to white parents in the 60s. And he um, grew up in a very, very racist area in London. And it's him, about his, him growing up and him becoming the front man of the ICF or the intercity firm. Um, basically these crews of every football team would have a crew of people who were like hooligans yeah. who would Ham. go around West Ham West would have Ham. their mm. crew which was, who was the ICF yeah. you know they'd have the naughty 40 up north you'd yeah. have the you know different different crews with different teams and they'd meet up whenever they their teams would, would play 
they'd probably meet up in a car yeah. park or a train station next door and have a fight. <laughs> and that was that was the culture in yeah. the 80s, you know, yeah. and it was until Margaret Thatcher um, clamped down on it. But it was basically the story of his life. Yeah. Um, and how he kind of got into it, he got into crime, and then he got out of it mm-hmm. and made a, a better life for himself. And he, it was very special, um, it was a very special project to him. So much so, in, the, in his life, not even in the story, he gets shot three times as a reprisal for beating up somebody so bad. He got shot in the chest three times, and he actually survived. Yeah. Two of the bu- bullets, the doctors could remove, but one had gone so far and got lodged near his spine that they thought they'd leave it. So he, had, he w- was walking around for ages with a bullet in his spine. Crazy. And then, I think a year later, it had worked its way to the surface of his back. And then the doctor said, and he, he was like, what is this? It feels like it's burning. And there was this bullet. And the doctor literally cut his, cut his skin, pulled it out. And it was a proper bullet. And he's, he's kept, he kept it for years. And he said to me, this is how important this film is to me. Wow. He said, I want you to have this bullet. Wow. And he gave me this bullet that had been lodged in. I still have it to this day. And I was like, this is a great honor. You know, it's, it's almost like a samurai giving you his sword, sword yeah. do you know what I mean like this is a, a big thing so he gave me that and I still have it and I and I was like boy this is pressure yeah but I just threw myself into it and I remember you know being it you know things that you go through before help you for what you're, is coming next and I remember being afraid in King Lear not knowing what I was going to do but the great thing about Cass is that I had him as a resource I could watch him how he spoke how he sniffed, how he, yeah. how he, how he was around his part, his wife, you know, it's kind of having that as a resource was just such a great thing, and I could just be as authentic as possible, you know, be real, and just tell his story for real. That movie is a cult class. I don't think you even understand. Like, I remember me and my friends going back and forth. I was shot. I was stabbed. <laughs> like we go back and forth with the lines. <laughs> like, like it was. It's an iconic film. <laughs> when you were making it, did you, did you? Kind of, did you feel that this? Yo, we're creating something. Uh, la- some stuff is going to live for a long time. Did you feel that? You know what? I I think I think I felt that afterwards. Okay. Because we shot it in twenty five days straight. Wow. We shot it without no break. Twenty five days. We shot mon- We shot Monday through Sunday. Monday through Sunday. We shot wow. every day. We, it was not a break. We shot twenty five days. Literally, the funding for the movie pulled out. Um, a month before and the, the director and the producer remortgaged their houses so they could get the film done. No literally, way. Literally, that's what happened. And, you know, John Baird, who directed it, um, was his first movie. Wow. And he's, you know, gone on to direct a lot of films since. But he's, he was, he was learning as, as we were going, you know. And I, that was, that was pretty early on for me. So mm. I was, I was trying to find my feet as well. And I just put, threw myself into it and we had, Leo Gregory in there. He was a great actor. Yeah. Tama Hassan. Yes, Tama. Proper know, geezers. Proper geezers, football <laughs> yeah. factory, all yeah. those kind of guys. And I really feel like it was a great thing. And we left, I think we left it all on the field. Do you yeah. know what I mean? We just went out there and just just put it all out there and just said, this is this is us and this is what we're doing. And I, I think after 25 days, I was just knackered. Yeah. I literally, I think I just got on a plane to like, the Caribbean. I went to yeah. Dominican Republic and yeah. just sat there for two weeks. Because yeah. I was just like, what just happened to yeah, me? Do you know now. what I mean? I had moments in that where I was so... There was stuff, so much stuff cut out of the movie, actually, that you haven't seen. I actually want to get hold of some of that yeah. footage because there was some stuff that we did that was like the psychological stuff that he went through that I think was some of the best acting I've ever done. Yeah. And um, we went places that, you know, I'd go home and then all of a sudden find myself crying because we were doing a scene where he's losing his mind and crying about his mum who's just died and he sees her in a dream and he's just like losing it. And you think as an actor, oh, I'll do my work and I'll go home. Nah. But I went home and I was just like, hold yes, on a minute, yeah. it's still with me, man. Mm. I think that's part of the craft. Yeah. That's part of the craft of it. And that's what I've fallen in love with is the craft of acting yeah. and actually creating the stories. I think initially it was a way out of, you know, poverty we didn't grow up with much 
I always thought to myself, if I could buy my own house, if I can buy my own house and have a few this and that. Now I've done all that, you know, yeah. I bought my own house, I bought my this and the stuff. What is the motivation now? Mm. What is the motivation? And it's the love of it. Yeah. It's the love of creating those, those moments that people look at and think, man, they take away something from this movie mm. or from this play or whatever it is, this story that will make them think about life slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Make them treat their wife a bit better or yeah. their boyfriend or husband a bit better. Or, you know what, maybe I can fix up and do something with my life. I, all these little things, I'm not saying one film can do it all, but little bits of little things make you think and make you change your life. I think The Matrix, I remember watching that movie for the first time and thinking how much that just changed my outlook on the world that we're living in because I always like thought, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Those kind of things. I think to, for me that was seminal. Yeah. You know, there are certain movies that have changed my thinking. Color Purple. Oh, yeah. You know, The Godfather. I know that everybody says The Godfather, but by those movies yeah. that really make you understand yeah. what filmmaking is about. You come to me on my daughter's birthday <laughs> and ask me for a favor? <laughs> Classics. Um, Don't even call me <laughs> All right, so casted big things and following that, um, you know, some big films happened for you. Rock and Roller, yes. Atonement, yeah. uh, a free a free part BBC drama called Occup uh, Occupation. Occupation, yeah. And, you know, some of your, you know, these things started to kind of really show you as an actor and make you more known to us. And then 2011, uh, Conan the Barbarian film happens. Yeah. And then um, you opposite Liam Neeson as well in The Grey. The Grey, yeah. And then... You know, people's favorite Games of Thrones Game happened. Of Game of Thrones happened as well, and it's like it seemed like 2011 was a really, a really big year for you. It, it definitely was actually. Um, you know what? I just kind of I remember 2010 going into 2011. We shot the beginning of that year. We shot the Grey, mm. and I remember going to um, Vancouver. And then going north to a place called Smithers, which is okay. quite near the Arctic Circle wow. in British Columbia. We went up a mountain and we stayed there for two months. Listen, when you see the grey, if you ever go back and watch yeah, yeah, that, yeah. it's real. It's all cold. We had frostbite. No green screen, nothing. Skin, skin <laughs> is peeling no off, way. like all those kind of things. So um, I came back and I was just like, yeah, this is, this is the kind of... I've got on so well with Frank Grillo and yeah. James Bradell, Liam Neeson, so many... Um, great actors and came back and was, I was just like on fire I was ready yeah. to do something else yeah. um, you know you just love of what you do is just fired up and so I was just going in and killing meetings going in there and just with a confidence of not not arrogant I'm, I'm gonna get it but yeah. I just went in with these meetings and I went on, in on a meeting I won't say what the film was yeah. but I went in on a meeting with this film and the director called my agent before I got out of the building and said, this is, this is the guy we want. This is the guy. This is a big movie. This was a really big movie. Um, and this is the guy we want. We just need to confirm it with the studio, blah, 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 this and that. Okay. So then proceeded another two months of negotiations or whether it was going to happen or this kind of thing. I'm kind of dropping work, not doing stuff. Just because, you of, know, yeah, just because of this yeah. thing. Turns out I didn't get the wrong. Get, went to someone else and I've turned down some really great stuff that would have been filming throughout that year and it was supposed to happen but this is why I think sometimes you might want something but for me God has a plan for you that's better than you even know and I think when I look back at that film that part that I didn't get actually got cut out completely no out of the movie way. they had like six months reshoots and cut that whole storyline out so it never even happened. I would have filmed that entire part and it, and it would have time. been gone. It would have been a waste of time. Wow. And wow. in that same time, I got Game of Thrones. Crazy. And then I would have missed out on Game of Thrones because I had been filming Probably something that. that no one would ever see. Did you foresee the success that Game of Thrones has had? Did you see that happening? I didn't, you know. I, 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 at the time I was filming, I didn't watch the... I was filming it just the second season was filming even before I think before I'd seen this, this, the first season so and I remember going in for a meeting for the first season of Game of Thrones 
and they were actually it was actually for um, what's his name um, the part that um, J Jason Momoa played okay okay it was yeah. actually yeah, yeah, I actually yeah. went in for that role and they were I'm in an R and not sure then I actually got occupation and I said you know what rather than wait for you I've got occupation I'm gonna go and do that and film this great movie with Stephen Graham and Warren Brown and um, Jimmy Nesbitt and I'm I'm going to go do that. So I went and did that. And so the next year, they were like, we loved that audition you did last year. This part is perfect for you. Okay. So it kind of just fell into a place. It made sense. That's it, amazing. It fell into a place. And I met, I literally met with Dan and DB and, and um, everybody, all the producers and the director of the, uh, of the first episode. And they literally made the decision on the spot. And, I, and I was the role. You know. Well done, man. And do you know what? It seems like you are trusted with the ability to bring mythical stories or, or characters to life as an actor you know the things that we've spoken about previously but yeah. also samson in the bible story yeah um also oh, there was another one that you did as well uh oh what was the other um, that role that you did as well it was a kind of like dracula when dracula, you were in dracula oh, Renfield. Yeah. yeah yeah and then also you know you for me you did amazingly well in um the classics cinderella and pan um mm -hmm. i think you did really well um in both of those thank you and so for me it's like what do you think it is that, or, or why is it that you have the ability to uh, to make these types of roles so believable? Like, you know, you, you know what? I think it goes back to the, that whole involvement with Shakespeare and storytelling, and the fantasy element of it. And ultimately, one thing I've learned and taken on from different directors and my own experience is the most important thing is the person that you're speaking to. Okay. And whatever you're trying to do to that person, you have to really believe it. You have to be true to the moment. So whatever you're doing, whether it's in a fantasy film or whether it's in a slapstick comedy, you know, like Nanny McPhee, or if it's in a thing, you still have to believe it. The center of it has to be truth. In the center has to be truth. But outside of it, it can be funny. It can be, you can be half horse, half man. You can be whatever it is. But then in the center, the core has to have truth. Okay. It can't be empty. And I think maybe that is the part of me that I let into the, the truth, mm -hmm. into every character that I play. That a lot of people say they can feel, like, I don't know, the, the love or joy or, of what I'm doing. I, I think essentially, when someone is enjoying what they're doing, other people connect with it. True. So hopefully that's, yeah, that's part of it. And me personally, I love animals and I love apocalyptic stories, so stories where the world might end. So yeah. it's a no-brainer that Zoo <laughs> was one of my favourite uh, TV series, and your character Abraham Kenyatta, um, wow. I think, was excellent. Thank um, you. My question for you is though: um, Did you actually have any real, I guess, experiences with real animals? With real animals. And also, do you believe that animals could possess such high intelligence and possibly gang up on us? Because I looked at animals differently after watching Zoom. <laughs> like, it had, me, it had me moving a little bit different. I was like, could they be plotting something? Because, you know, I'll I, I tell you a story why. I, there, there was this group of cats, yeah, yeah. that um, when I lived in Birmingham, when I went to university, and, um, bro, like, they, it almost seemed like they were plotting something. Like, because they would all, I'm talking about maybe 20, 30 cats, they would come together yeah. on this road that I lived on and would stay together. So, like, when I watched Zoo, I'm like, Maybe something's more is going on here. So tell me about your experience. Yeah, tell no, I, it was an amazing, I, amazing series. Thank you, man. For you people who don't know, Zoo is a series which um, takes place maybe in an alternate reality or a distant future, not so distant future, where animals have had have this gene called the ghost gene like, yes. that kicks in. Basically, when when humans have have made enough of a mess of the world that the animals have Taking it, back, taking right? it to task to yeah. take out the human race. Yeah. So every species of animal starts attacking human beings and tries to wipe them out. So that's the premise of Zoo. Sick. And for me, I play um, Abraham Kenyatta, who is who is a um, he starts off as a, as a kind of a safari guy, mm. and he turns he turns into a kind of like much more of a zoologist, mm -hmm. a doctor, you know. And I at first the first season we dealt with a lot of real animals. Yeah. I was like this far away from a grizzly bear and this far away from two lions um, and a cheetah at one point and you know I had to carry a snake I had to go you know in the first season we used a lot of animals unfortunately there are a lot of um, and none of them were harmed and they're all treated very well but 
I felt there was a lot of, um, I think the network got a lot of complaints from people saying that they didn't want real animals used. Okay. So if you notice in the season two and three, there were a lot more CGI yeah, animals could tell. and a yeah, lot yeah. more mutated animals. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? yeah. So that's what that's where they went on to. I do think that we're finding out a lot more about animals now. I mean, only the other day I was watching one of those documentaries. I think it was Planet Earth or um, Planet Earth, and it was uh, talking about how herds of They've only just discovered that herds of um, elephants can be miles and miles yeah. apart, but they travel in the same direction. Yeah. And then they, they're actually communicating yeah. with this really low frequency sound. And they'll, cha they'll turn left at the same time and they'll turn right at the same time, but they can be miles apart. And we've only just found that out yeah. in the last few years. So there's a lot more, I think, in terms of awareness. In terms, of, Sometimes you ever look at a cat or a dog even, yeah. and they're just looking at something that you don't know what they're looking yeah. at. Maybe it's a deeper Scientists have said for yeah. years that we're in a multi-dimensional mm. space and they, they could be seeing things in other dimensions. Mm. That's just a thought. Yeah, no, but you I... Know, I until we start getting into conspiracy no, it's possi theories. No, but it's possibilities. Kind of it definitely. I, and I think that's kind of where, where my um, affinity with the zoo came. And also maybe where my interest in animals... Like, I love David Attenborough. Mm. I love the shows that he does. So it's like, I'm always interested on finding out real things, but also thinking about alternate kind of like possibilities. And I think yeah. Zoo did that for us. Yeah. Um, moving forward, Hollywood actor Chris Pine, Hollywood actor Monso and Ozzy, um, <laughs> Hollywood film Jack Ryan. Um, nice, I don't <laughs> great, great film. But what I wanted to speak about is that is it true that when you guys had your fighting scene, you had a little bit of a tussle? I say tussle with you, it's probably more of a one sided tussle. Uh. Yeah, but is it true that? Um, you know, you got so deeply into the characters that you ended up mistakenly breaking Chris Pine's finger. Oh, oh, yeah, that is true. That <laughs> is, is true? absolutely true. <laughs> that is true. We we kind of there's is the bit when he runs at me. We end up in the bath. Yeah. Um, I was supposed to kind of go low. Yeah. And he was supposed to go high, so I could kind of lift him. Yeah. And we ended up just coming at each other straight. Oh wow! And literally, our hands just clasped and clipped each other. Ooh. And it, and it, and his finger snapped. Not across, but down. His Ooh. finger had a spiral fracture <laughs> down it. So it was like, and he was just like, he was able to move it Ooh. afterwards. But he was like, ah, my hand, my hand. And the people thought he was just being a little, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, be a diva. But he yeah. was, he was, um, he, when they went and scanned it, they showed he had a spiral fracture all the way down his finger. Bloody so hell. it was, and he had to film the rest of the movie like that. Legend. And do other other kind of films and I'm forever forever I've apologised for that and we, we've remained friends since then yeah you know. but you're method actors you're in you know you're in the characters yeah, man you're in the characters of, it's one of those things that you yeah. go through now, the, now you see you yeah, you're a very smooth guy yeah okay. but something tells me you've got a little gangster in you yeah I don't know what it is so I wanted to ask you when it comes to music like is there any UK music or even US music that you kind of maybe use to kind of get you into your maybe in a gym Get, yeah. you in, get you into your cast pennant, you know what I mean? Get you into your, into your yeah, zone. What, yeah. what do you listen to? <sighs> you know what? In terms, of, in terms of the UK scene, I like Chip. I like okay. Bugsy Malone. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and I, I, particularly when they were having that beef. Yeah, I yeah, kind yeah. Of really, <laughs> it, was, it was very interesting. I kind of really was getting into that. Mm. Um, really, I think I'm more of an r &B okay. kind of R&B hip-hop guy. And American music has always been the thing, but in terms of UK, mm, yeah. What in the US do you like? What, what, what I like Getz. I like Getz actually. Okay, big up my brother. Like He's coming on well. here actually soon. So yeah. yeah, big up Getz. Yeah, I like Getz. Yeah. I like and the governor, of, yeah. of course. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so I've listened to a lot. I've listened to yeah, a lot. Cool. Like that, and you like the R and B as well. R and B's coming back, man. It like, is, but you know, obviously, my nighty stuff is just of course, be, will be rocking Afro beats. Yeah, of course. A little bit of Tiwa Savage, a little bit of Big you know, Tiwa, man. yeah. Afro yeah. beats is, is is doing things in a, a strong bit of star way. Boy. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Strong yeah. way, it's good, man. I think music kind of helps us as well to kind of maybe sometimes take ourselves to a place of just like maybe even just away from what we're doing. Like for me, yeah. I, I have moods for music. Like at the moment, I'm just to a lot of like um, African house. I don't know what it's like South African house. Like I, I, that's becoming like quite big. Bro, right? but I don't even understand what they're saying. But something's just resonating with my yeah, spirit. Yeah, yeah. Like, it just makes me feel. Well, so there's two guys that are doing really well. What Black Coffee. Called? Yeah, maybe. yeah I Black think Coffee, that's it. and um, uh, I think he's Nigerian. That this other guy. What's his name? Um, on. Uh, uh, I'll tell you his name after. I can't remember. But there's another Nigerian guy who's yeah. doing quite big things as well. But yeah, man, it's like I think music is good for us, man. For it's, it's, it could be therapeutic. Mm. But getting back to you. Yes. 
back into your career now um one thing that i really um i i really i really always hear about is that you know there's a lot of not nice in hollywood but i i noticed that you managed to just really just work your way through and get the job done and you don't seem to ever be phased or changed by it. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be a lot of young aspiring actors who would like to emulate the way that you do that and just kind of, um, you know, I guess, get to the work, get to the progress. Um, what kind of advice would you give to them in terms of how you've done it yourself to kind of like work their way through in that way? My advice would be to, before you get into this game, before you get into the storytelling world, you know, you really have to know, understand it, do a lot of research, understand what it is that you're getting into. And, you know, develop a business mind as yeah. well as a creative mind yeah. and separate the two. Yeah. So, you know, for many years, I'd be happy with acting on a, on a piece of grass for people for free. But that's not going to get your bills paid. So you need to develop a business mind. So when negotiations are being done, you need to think of every facet. Yeah of what you bring yep. um, to the project that makes you more valuable. So you have to have the business mind as well. But the, the key thing for me is um, remember what it was that made you start in the beginning. Remember what it was that made you start in the beginning. And hold on to that because as soon as you start to make money, as soon as you start to become successful, become a little famous what are your motivations what is going to take you past the point when you start getting a few of the things that you desired and I could tell you one thing fame isn't one of the things to desire because it's not really it's fleeting yep. a lot of the time you think it's real love that people are giving you people can admire your work and ex you know, express it to you but the audience to, is here today and they're on to the next thing tomorrow 100%. and that is the thing is to keep your your family for me it's been my family and my faith mm -hmm. as the core center of my life and that is has always been there and that is always something that I've hold on to so whatever happens in the business that, that is fickle that can change I'm always I've always got that that center and that grounded and whatever it is in your life that grounds you find it recognize it and make it your anchor in the world because you need an anchor to come back to because there are many disappointments and many points in this in this in this business where you think it's going well and even when sometimes the hardest thing is when it's going well and you don't feel the way you thought you were going to feel <laughs> that's that that can yep. be one of the hardest things yep. when you actually right I'm actually Riding this car I always wanted to drive. I'm living in a house I always wanted to live in. Why am I not happy? Find out what it is that you really makes you want to do it and hold on to that. That's my advice. Brilliant advice. Brilliant advice. And, you know, one thing that I like about your social media is that I feel like you always show gratitude, humility, in the form of faith. Like, in the form of faith. So, faith and a career in this industry, how well do they suit? Mm. Well, for me, um, having faith is imperative. It's, it's deadly important. I, I really believe that in an industry where you, you have no physical evidence about what your next job is coming from. <laughs> 100%. You have no idea who's talking about you. Yep. You have no idea what's coming around the corner. Or if you're ever going to work again. You have to have some kind of faith. True. <laughs> whether you call it belief, whether you call yeah. it faith, whether you call it positive thinking, yeah. or bringing the universe to you, or whatever you want to call it, for me it's faith. True. And you have to have that faith. That. So for me, it, it goes hand in hand. hand. I think what you might be getting at, and sometimes in an industry where it's very secular, yep. and you're in a place where there's not a lot of people who who believe in God or anything or, you know, and I think we're in a society where everything is okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to do that? That's fine. Mm -hmm. You want to do that? That's, that's okay. That's, that's great. Mm -hmm. Unless you offend somebody, yeah. but any, anything, whatever it is, go you can it. do it. Yeah. Just go and do it. Mm -hmm. And I think so, having some 
a different walk and knowing yourself and having faith is so helpful because you can still you can just be yourself um you know there there are points in in life where other actors or even a director or two has had a problem with my faith or not a problem or just questioned it or just like why why do you you know <laughs> hello You know, there are there are points in life where other people in the industry have questioned my faith or wanted to know more, been inquisitive, um, and we'll have a conversation. I'm open. I'm very. There's nothing kind of to hide. You know, um, so I, I talk about it, and if it gets to a point where I feel like it's a derogatory thing or something like that, then I, I'll end it there. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think maybe being as physically imposing as I am has helped <laughs> in a sense, in, in some ways, in some ways where people yeah. don't want to take it further, yeah. do you know what I mean? Maybe I should stop <laughs> before get, Lotto gets angry. Do you, yeah. I, don't, I don't use my physicality in any yeah. way to, to, to intimidate anyone. Yeah. But people have seen mm. that and also people kind of... Until they get to know you, they, they, they're kind of a little bit, you yeah, know what I mean? Of course. As they should be, you know. I think in life, I think it's life, it's healthy to have a little bit of that. Yeah. It's healthy. Yeah, definitely. And um, for you, what is the... Oh. Excuse me. Yeah, just let her know, please. Because I'm, I'm nearly finished. Just let her know, because like, we're finished before they're going to open anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. For you, what would be the ultimate aim in your career? What is it that you, you know, something that you're really aiming for as something that would be, you know what, I feel like I've really completed a major goal yeah. in my career? Well, there there has there have been two projects that I really, really want to bring to life. And for me, my own uh, company that I've set up already, um, bringing these two projects to life would be my ultimate aim. Cool. I'm getting a lot more into producing now and creating content. Cool. Um, whether that is as an executive producer, as an investor, as a, or as, a, as not necessarily a producer who brings everything together, but almost like an associate producer okay. who will help bring different elements together yeah. on a project. We did a great um, thing with a director called Kwame Lestrade called Bail. Okay. which we're entering into different film festivals right now, um, which is a film about consent and wow. asking the question about what consent is. And yeah. it's a very interesting topic right now. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. You'll probably see that on different I media so. platforms yeah. soon. Yeah. Um, there's another TV show I'm kind of producing at the same time. Um, but the ultimate goal is is to, con to have... I've always had the goal for me, it, within my career is to have a lifelong career. And however, you know, however I change, how I age, to always be able to tell yeah. stories yeah. and feed into stories yeah. in that way. And the prayer is that that gives me the knowledge, the financial ability, the, the connections to create the stories that I want to tell. Course, yeah. And that is my ultimate, that's my ultimate I goal. I love that. I, I get from that that you see ownership as being important as well then. Oh yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting. I think the older I get, the more I do start to think about legacy and the more I do think about what I leave, not only for my future children, you know, but the children of everyone else coming up True. in in the world and what they are going to benefit from. Yeah. You know, we've got to be careful about what we're putting out there that is going to feed the next generation. 100%. So for me, that is what's important. Cool. So what is next for you? I guess maybe what you can speak about what's coming next. Okay, what is next for me? Last year was a very busy year and it's into 2019. It's becoming even more busy. Good. Um, I've got a great movie coming out this summer called Artemis Fowl. Yeah, I've seen some The trailer's like just come yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Kenneth yeah. Branagh directed it. It's um, based on a series of books by Yoin Kofa. Okay. Um, about a criminal mastermind kid who um, who basically his father goes missing and, and 
in the process of trying to find him with the aid of his trusty butler, security guard, um, media handler, um, like a man of all seasons. Yeah. Um, we go on a, on a mission to try and find out where he is and try to get him back. And in the process, we realize that there is a whole world beneath our feet and all around us that we don't even see. Yeah. Um, so it takes us into the kind of the criminal underworld, the fairy world, where there are goblins and trolls and all kinds of all Sick. kinds of things. So it's, it's a, uh, hopefully it's going to be a really successful mm. franchise and something that's going to move us forward. So that's another Disney um, thing, and it's kind of interesting. It really feels like I've been in, invited into the Disney family. Yeah, you're definitely in now, another, man. It's a definite. It's another. It's going to be a non so dull suit that, no. we, can, that uh, we can have. I actually got measured up for that. I actually oh, got wow. me- they actually took pictures and they, they, they have like a hundred cameras around you oh, from wow. all angles and they take pictures of every part of you. Oh, like, it, it was lots of fun. That's coming out. Yeah. I also did another film, which was um, definitely a much more um, grown up movie. Yeah. It's about the Panama Papers and. Um, money laundering basically and it was a great opportunity to work with Steven Soderbergh, uh, Meryl Streep, Antonio Banderas and Gary Oldman and you know so for me to be involved in projects like that is always a blessing. That's a big cast man. Yeah. Big cast. Yeah. Absolutely. Well listen I wish you the best of luck. I can tell that these projects that you've got coming are going to be further successes. They're going to be further successes without a doubt and I wish you all the best of luck and once again I am so proud of everything that you're doing it gives us all inspiration as well thank you you're one of us you're, 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 you're one of us you're one of our own and it's like it's amazing to see that you can take it from where we're from and go as far as you're going and it's amazing and become a Disney part of the Disney family <laughs> do you know what I mean that's a big achievement in its own oh, do you know what I mean thank you very much so but good, before you good. go like I said I want to take you down a trip uh, down memory lane Yes. And I've got a game called You Better Recognize. Yeah, right. you better recognize. And usually what I do is I do it with music artists and we bring up like maybe old lyrics, old songs. You're an actor, so I changed it. So I've edited a little video together. Oh gosh. Of um some of your um amazing performances as an actor. And what I want you to do is I want to see if you recognize what comes next in the scene. And also if you can recognize and remember the lines that you say next in the scene oh, as well. Oh gosh. So what happens next is like a, a standard point, but if you can remember the lines as a bonus point. Oh. Alright? So I've got the video here. Let me just bring it oh, right God. to. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! I want to bring it back further than here. Hold on. Right, here we go. Stop it! 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 You're going, ah, oh, we're going, or something like that. And then I go, ah, oh, and I pull, throw everything off the table. Passionate acting. Yeah. Let's see if you're right, though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. This bit right. here. I will leave you alone. I'm going to take you to Linda. Real acting. The passion. If you're planning on doing that, no more blood to stop you. My mother was born. God brought her a child. Me. Hey. But there are things I must not do. One of the hardest things is to watch yourself. Yeah. On film. This, ah. is, this next this next clip is from Samson. Um. So do you remember what happened after this? You were. You said. Um, so my mother was mother. Um, Is that when the angel came and talked to her? No. Okay. This is when you were describing something to a rather untrustworthy lady. <laughs> oh, my mother was barren. Oh, and then, then basically she starts cutting my hair. Yes. Yeah. In your sleep. I've only seen that once, you know. Have you not only seen it once? I've only seen that you, once. You watched it back? I haven't watched it. Oh I never God. watch anything I do. Oh, like, you over. should, man. I watch it once. Epic, man. And, and I don't go, I feel like it, if you go back, you stay in that moment. Okay, fair enough. Like, you dwell okay. on it. Like, kind of, I feel that way. I don't fair know. Enough. I just, 
sometimes I watch. This, I've probably watched a few yeah. times. Though. So this is from Game of Thrones. Um, this yep. is a, a, a scene in Game of Thrones. Now, I'm not going to even play it any further. Do you remember what happens after this? Is there something that you do after this? Do you remember? Oh, yes. I say I invoke Sumai and I cut my hands. I vouch for her and for her dragons. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's play it. I invoke Sumai. Guess. I will vouch for her, her people, and her dragon. Ah, oh, I, yeah. right. I got the lines right. I got the lines right. I got the lines right. Bonus points. All right. We're Welcome. Here. Welcome. Be it on your head. Be it on your head. That's the one. That's the one. Welcome to cars, my, my lady. lady. Yes, yes, yes. Debonair with it as well. Oh, Let's fast Lord. forward. All right. So they run up. Okay, okay we'll yeah. go No, no, we're going to fast forward after this. We've got another scene, but I left it a bit longer, but I just like the scene. You want to conquer the seven kingdoms for the Dothraki? I want them because they're mine by right. Mm -hmm. The Iron Throne is. All right, so here now we have uh, the scene from Jack Ryan with you and Chris Pine. Okay, okay. um, I'm going to play a little bit and I want you to tell me what happens go ahead, go. I next after I stop it. The no, that's okay, I can get it from here. I'm supposed to take the room. Okay. Welcome, Mr. Ryan. Hi. Just your signature, please. Mr. Shraven hopes the room will be to your satisfaction. What happens after this? He, um, Jack Ryan, goes and admires the view. Yep. And as he's admiring the view, he sees my reflection in, his, in the back of him holding up a gun. Get ready to shoot. Okay, let's see. Bad man. <laughs> this scene was sick. <laughs> sick. Ah, yes, and the view is second to none. Now, this next scene oh, Lord. is okay. from Zoo. Mm -hmm. um, a very uh, a very emotional, passionate scene. Right. I'm going to pause it in a second and you tell me what happens after. Is my son dying? I'm working on it, son. Hang on. You said the transfusion of my blood would save the baby. Should have. Should have? Do we even know what you're doing? What is that? I synthesized the hybrid growth factors. Like I said, the only way to save your son is to accelerate the pregnancy and induce labor. I'm sorry, but it's the only way. What happens after this? Do you remember? What happens is Jackson comes in behind him, distracts him for a second, and I, I knock him out. Smack him in the face. I knock you yeah, right yeah. here. Let's get out of that tank. Sir, I have to inject this serum into that tank now. What if it kills her? It won't. You have to trust me. I don't trust you. The girl I love is floating in a tank like a freak experiment. You put her in there. Your son is going to die. Sir! Ooh, that was a nice punch. I always wonder if you actually hit people when, when they're acting. I always, I always, I always wonder if you hit the people. I actually got hit once. Oh, wow. In Cass, actually. Wow. When I did Cass in the prison cell okay. fight with Zulu. <laughs> what do you call you, Chokai? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you call you, Chokai? He actually punched me for real. Like, oh, it was God. like, it was, I, I stepped into it by accident. I mean, both. Wow. I almost got spot me. Bloody awesome. I think, do you know what? That's a strong 98% of all lines and all scenes that you remembered. Very wow, impressive. But well, some you, of them were a long time ago as well. Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah, Nonso, you. I just want to say thank you so much for joining me, man. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I picked up so many gems. Thank I feel you. like even people that may be watching may have picked up things as well and learned things and can take it in their own careers and their lives. Yeah. Um, we love you, man. We, we support you. Um, we're pushing you all the way. Um, and thank you so much for coming on. Thank man. you, I appreciate brother. It. And I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you, giving. sir. You know, artists to different people that are a platform to come yeah, and talk man. about, you know, mature their journey. Mature conversations, man. Thank you. That's what it's all about. It's mature conversations. It's hashtag Roach Real Talk. Big up Nonso. Make sure you stay in tune with everything that he's doing. He's doing massive things. And I will see you next time. Thank you.